Anthony Conright, my friend, it's great to be with you, man. Yeah, same. Good to see you again. Of course, of course. You wrote a phenomenal article. Um, the title is How the Right Retired, Negro File and Substituted Woke. Um, assume I haven't read this. I have, but assume I haven't. Tell me what this article is about. It's looking at how what, what wokeness is, not as a word, but looking at it as how Black people experience a dynamic. And that dynamic is essentially being a trigger for, for, for phobia, right? In, in all of the ways one can be a trigger for phobia, but also how Black people can be a trigger for philia, so obsession. Right. So that there's no such thing as um, like a black person just making a mistake just because people make mistakes. Um, but also the just the fact that the, the fact of blackness, I should say, triggers phobia. So you might you know, this is why somebody who is just bird watching, a black person who's just bird watching isn't just bird watching. They are on the verge of carrying out some uh, racialized terroristic threat <laughs> by you know taking a, a picture of a canary of some of some sort, and so that's what I wanted to capture because the way the the media um, on both sides have been talking about wokeness as it was as if it were um, this sort of resurrection of political correctness, and I thought that's just a um, an incorrect that's not a holistic view of it because that's really looking at it how white people experience quote unquote political correctness and not looking at how black people uh experience being a stimulus for fear and obsession yeah you do this really great thing in your writing where you situate the things of today within kind of their historical context and, and specifically with regard to race I, I think you do that you know exceptionally well and, and this is certainly no you know this is certainly a part of that kind of universe of you doing this well you, you you start this uh, this essay here uh, with a quote from the essay uh, from the New York Times, um, specifically this title of of an article, an editorial titled "The Mystery of Negrophilism," um, and I thought something that they said in there, I thought it was really really poignant, and it gets to your point that you just made. Like there's this extraordinary interest they describe in the Negro. That is their kind of definition of this word. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that extraordinary interest then? And you, you shared about the bird watcher in New York City, but but could you share a little bit more about how that extraordinary interest um, intersects with our times today? So there, there are a couple of things in thinking about that article in particular, because I thought um, there were a couple of phrases in the article that really captured the dynamic that I think Black people, um, that, that we find ourselves in. And it's this idea of, um, and the, the author kind of gets at this, well, there are, uh, I think it says something about Negroes being in Africa, but no one really cares. Uh, so what's going on about the, um, what's what's happening with the American Negro that that's so fascinating and why is everyone so obsessed with their plight? And there are a couple of other articles um, around that time that kind of have a similar um, sentiment. And the sentiment essentially is, why does everything have to be about race? Now we're talking about like 18, you know, 62, 64, and their references to uh, Negro philism even before that. But what I thought was fascinating was like, we're like in a war, like literally about race and slavery. And you're asking why does everything have to be about slavery when literally you're having um, this sort of existential crisis about, that's, that's centered on race. And so that same sentiment, um, of, as you know, exists today where you'll have people on, on the right and even some liberals in some instances go, well, why does everything have to be about race? Can't we just talk about the economy a little bit? Can't we just um, be like race blind in certain respects? Like can't, you know, why does everything have to be about the plight of black people? And so um, in that article, um, 
it's really talking about like there's a there's a there's a sentence in there it's something like the the mere the rest of us are sort of mere ciphers and i thought that was an interesting way to sort of position what the essence of you know wokeness neurophilia and neurophobia is because if we think of what it means to be in a, not to sound too, I don't know, theoretical or heady, but in terms of like what it means to live in an anti-Black world, that means that there is um, an entire existence based on not being Black. And so that identification of not being Black or or, or being moved away from wanting to be Black, sort of the... the um, essentially like anti-blackness, I think was captured like the, the authors, I don't know if they did it on purpose, but they captured it so, so, so well, because it's like, why do we need to be, what's, what's so interesting about the, the, the Negro, you know, um, people said that there, uh, I forget the, the quote, but it was a, a civilization it was a oh Africa, a place where you know God turned their his back on civilization or something like that, and um, I thought, wow, this is this person is really capturing the sort of um, impossibility of being black without triggering anything in anyone else. You have a quote in here where you say, as a pejorative, woke isn't too distant from its predecessors, race agitator your lover, Negrophile. Why do you think it's necessary for these words to change and evolve over time? And, and I'm speaking specifically about the necessity, perhaps, that whiteness has for there to be a new, uh, shiny, um, slightly distant word um, to describe this, this sentiment over time. Well, to, I would think about it like this. So if people... If there's a group of people that are supposed that are supposed to suffer, their entire existence is uh, to be not human. So all of the feelings and the emotions that one would describe to someone that is human, there's there's a wall between black people and all of those things, right? So in the same way, you know, if we're walking on the street and you step on an ant and kill it, you're not thinking you've created you've you know committed some act of humanity. You're like, well, it's just it's just an ant. It was like in my way, didn't mean to step on it, but I did. That's just about what it was for for black people. So like, why would why would any non black person love? A black person why would any non-black person care about how black people live doesn't make sense these people are supposed to suffer they are our cattle they are our uh sort of uh, birthing vessels like that's what that's what they are they are supposed to suffer so it's abnormal to care so much about what's happening to them and so that um is why we have words like like you know lover or negro file because the view is how could you love why well why would you love the unlovable and so um in a weird in a weird way and david david cross actually has a funny bit about this in an old uh stand-up from like years ago but in a way like being a negro file or a negro lo lover is it can be taken as like an, a, a compliment of sorts in a way. And then there's a, there's actually, there was actually a piece um, I referred to um, in what I wrote where uh, a, a writer is responding to being uh, called a Negro file where he says, well, it, it takes a Negro, it takes a Negro foe to recognize a Negro file. And he self identifies as a Negro file. And I thought that was, so, that was such a good way to kind of turn it on his head. Um, Joe Walsh, believe it or not, from uh, the Tea Party days, it, you know, if you look at his Twitter, he, he will say, I'm woke and I'm proud and happy to be woke. I think everybody should be woke. And I think that's kind of how society should be thinking of some of this. Um, some of this language that comes out of the the right like but then also you do have to be cautious of that care becoming sort of uh 
perverse, uh, pornographic in a way, and, and turned into this really toxic obsession. So there's a fine line you have to be able to walk. You mentioned the word woke, and I think this is a per perfect time to kind of transition to uh, modern times. You know, the word woke is is almost anathema these days. It feels like on both the right and the left, people don't even want to use it for reasons. You get into some of those reasons, specifically talking about Christopher Rufo. If our audience is unfamiliar with who this is, could you maybe introduce him? Yeah, so um, he is this Manhattan Institute fellow that was based in Seattle. And um, a lot of the, so he had been doing, he gets a tip, he gets a tip that the city of Seattle is engaging in, um, oh, I, I forget the, the, uh, the training that they were doing, but they were looking at homelessness as a result of um, white supremacist like practices. So they're essentially looking at how um, race impl impacts homelessness and how tenants of white supremacy um, influence those, uh, like influences homelessness. Uh, and so that leads him onto this crusade of going after uh, critical race theory, which really kind of happened because um, I think in this training, the the facilitators may have referred to Robin D'Angelo's uh, White Fragility or something like that. And in that book, there's a footnote where she refers to critical race theory. Like it's actually, it, they, she doesn't really even mention it in the book. If there is a mention, it's like once. And so he takes that and as the right does, creates this whole conspiracy theory about critical race theory and all of these things. And um, that in turn, you know, bled into uh, wokeness, which they, which, you know, comes from black vernacular. And so he just like did this weird, like jujitsu quasi intellectual, like leap <laughs> connecting a bunch of things that aren't necessarily connected in a, in a cohesive way. And he, essentially just said, we are going to um, demean critical race theory and fear monger it until it sticks. And unfortunately, it it did. And so that's what happened with uh, wokeness. Yeah, I, I, I'd be honest, I have to be honest with you and say it, 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 there are very few things that upset me more than the bastardization of the word woke. It, it was such a good word. It was such a good word within our own community for right. decades, for right. so long. We were like using this word and enjoying it and knew what it meant. And it was this signifier that you could say to another black person, almost in this kind of internal communal kind of sense. It, it, yeah. it was within, you know, and there was high con. We, we really got the context. We understood. Mm -hmm. And now, it's been so abused and bastardized mm -hmm. and completely, you know, stripped from its context that it feels unreasonable. If I walked up to you as another black man was like, hey, stay woke, brother. Like you would probably be like, ah, that's a little awkward. You know, it's a little weird, right? Right. And so I, I kind of give that anecdote because it feels um, like when the far right, but specifically when when white supremacy gets a hold of black things, it, it has no understanding of how to even grasp them without breaking them. And so it it, it really, you know, for me, that's it, it's upsetting. I, I lament, um, you know, the ways in which white supremacy has broken wokeness um, as a concept um, that that I enjoyed for a while. Um, OK, you talked a little bit about America's favorite governor. Um, OK, I'm being a little tongue in cheek here. <laughs> you talked about uh, Governor Ron DeSantis. And we know, of course, he's used this word. This has almost been like one of like his core tenets in it, kind of the way he talks about, you know, the culture war. He talks about wokeness. Um, how are politicians deploying these ideas um, to further their political goals? 
Yeah, so that's a good question. Ron DeSantis is basically this very dry, no personality having. It looks like his face hurts when he smiles, like politician that was doing his best Trump impression to gain, you know, traction amongst the right. And for a long time, it it worked. And all he did really was say, Black Lives Matter protests are bad, so we're going to do what we can to restrict them. Guns are good. Uh, the death penalty is fantastic. And um, everything, you know, that is quote unquote woke needs to die. That's Ron DeSantis. And you, he basically, he, he uses just old school right uh, fear mongering tactics to do what he does. Um, but he, um, unfortunately just is kind of this like very dry vanilla, like Trump wannabe. And, um, because he has no personality of his own, he has to leech on to other things. So, um, once, so I think we have to remember, uh, cause someone comment made this comment on Twitter about, well, it doesn't, you know, wokeness and uh, Negro philia or uh, it doesn't have like a one to one. Um, it's not a really a one to one analogy because wokeness also includes um, LGBT rights and trans rights and all these things. And I think we have to remember that it the root of wokeness, where it starts is race. That's where it starts. And because you are able to um, use race to trigger, you can trigger the fear of black people. You can now use that opening that's caused by that to, to jump into other things, you know? So like if black people have rights, oh my God, what's next? Gay people, you know, like if gay people have rights, what's next? Trans people. Oh my God, what are we going to do with people who, um, don't even like identify with the gender? So like, that's how it, that's how it starts. And so that's really how, uh, in particular, like on the right, they've used this word. And so now it no longer just applies to race. It can apply to communism, socialism, um, gay rights, abortion, uh, police reform, it can apply to anything. And so that's essentially how they've used it. So you don't, you don't like hot dogs. Well, you know, those woke hot dogs that they're selling at the stadium, you like, that's how they, that's how they're using it. Where if there is something that is going to, uh, uh, trigger fear in white, people, uh, in in particular white conservatives, then whatever that thing is, they just call it woke. Yeah. uh, Dr. Ian Ian Haney Lopez um, from UC Berkeley talks about this idea of strategic racism, the ways in which politicians utilize racist rhetoric, racist ideas, um, for the for the ends of political power, uh, it's maybe not even they don't even necessarily have to believe these ideas, right? Like there have been many people who have said like, oh, Donald Trump, you know, hires people of color or always got along with rappers or whatever it is. They don't necessarily have to believe these ideas or even implement them um, full bore within their own lives, but they leverage them, they deploy them as ways to gain and maintain political power. And you, you mentioned uh, a governor um, or at least a gubernatorial candidate from way back when, going back into history a little bit, Eugene Talmadge. Um, and, and so that that kind of comes to mind as, as a really great example. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about who Talmadge was and how he kind of leveraged some of these terms uh, within his campaign context? So. He so basically he is um, a a, a Ron DeSantis before there's Ron DeSantis. So um, there was this uh, incident where uh, he went after college professors because of the books that they were teaching. And at the and at the time, um, like the 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 greatest sort of sin committed uh, or held as an example was like a black kid and a white kid just playing together. They weren't doing anything crazy out of the norm. They weren't saying burn America down. They're just together, right? And so at the time, the the 
Negro files were people who wanted integration. And you can actually, there are newspapers, newspaper accounts, and I didn't include these in the article, but um, <laughs> there's one paper that's smearing a politician um, because he he's a Negro file that wanted uh, integration. And so it's the same thing, right? You would see, you know, from you know, right wing politicians saying, well, look at this left wing uh, congressperson. They are, you know, they're, they're, they're woke and they're going to defund the police and all these things. And so back then it was just about integration. And so uh, Talmadge at this point, he like goes after these uh, professors and I forget the actual name of it. It, it was something um, affair. I can't, it, it might come back to me later. But anyway, the point being was they were like talking about burning all of these books and um, banning, uh, you know, Negrophile doctrines from schools because, you know, Negrophilia threatened to bring down the, the American empire. And so Talmadge used a lot of the same tactics that, you know, we're seeing today on the right in terms of banning books and going after educators and trying to shut down schools and things like that. Yeah, I, I just loved that historical tidbit in part because I I grew up in Georgia. I grew up in Atlanta <laughs> and I am like a third generation Atlanta. All my generations are from Georgia as far back as we can go. Right. And so like like it's just really kind of cool, like bit of history in part because my dad um, growing up, he heard these he heard about he he knew about Talmadge specifically he heard the the radio um advertisements that that Talmadge would would leverage on on the airwaves mm -hmm. and a really really interesting thing that he did he he would have these radio ads these kind of campaign ads on the radio mm -hmm. where he would say uh there are two planks in my platform this is a quote there are two planks planks in my platform mm -hmm. And roads. I'm for one and I'm against the other. And that would be the rate that would be the ad. And that would like be it. And my, my father grew up hearing this on the radio. This is like a normal thing. No one's hiding it, not convert covert, not on some like, you know, far flung parts of the internet on a message board. This was like everybody's hearing this on the radio, including my dad. Right. And so to see this kind of evolution of the discourse where the words have changed right like like the style of communication may have changed <clears throat> but in many ways the actual like ends the outcomes are, are are almost the same right like like you can almost imagine pulling together a ron DeSantis ad that says i'm against wokeness and i'm for business Right. Like there are two planks in my platform. <laughs> Wokeness in business. I'm for one and against the other. You can almost like kind of like it, it doesn't feel that far fetched. Right. Or like like wokeness and rights. I'm against one and for the other. Whatever kind of framing they want to kind of give here. But my point is that even though the language has changed in many ways, the outcomes and even the undercurrent has remained the same. Right. What are your thoughts on that? It's, yeah, I, I, t I look at it, it's exactly to what you're saying. It's the dynamic has not changed. And we, it's really difficult to talk about things that we don't have a language for. And, and again, and I, I hate that it sort of sounds overly theoretical or intellectual because it really isn't. You, we have to remember that um, despite whatever myth or lie we want to say about America and its founding and its um, existence, to be Black was to be tethered to slaveness. It's it's the same thing. Like that's what it that's what it means to be Black is to be is to be in the positionality of the slave. But we don't really know how to talk about it in that way and so and and understandably so we make a lot of attempts to valorize that and i understand where that's coming from and um over time as society as as people have somewhat 
changed, what is sort of acceptable to say has also changed, right? So while you may not be able to say certain words or put certain things in political ads, the dynamic of what you what you're getting at in terms of how you might use a synonym to replace something, i.e., you know, uh, woke for Negro file, you're still touching on the same exact dynamic, which is how do we talk about caring for a group of people who are positioned as slaves? That's like the root, I think, of everything that's. Um, happening right now we really don't know how to go well how do we in the same way you know when education was was being sort of formalized in the u.s in terms of uniformity of curriculum and all these things well they're not thinking of well we should really teach the history of these people who were positioned as slaves they're not thinking that and so if you had brought it up which didn't even which really didn't happen it would be abnormal so still to this day as we've seen with republican um, legislatures across the country to teach black history is sort of abnormal because it's difficult to understand that black people have a different existence than non-black people in America. And that existence is based off of being positioned as a slave. And when that is the basis of your existence, you're gonna have a totally different interpretation of what this country is, what's being said, how and why laws are passed. And unfortunately, we have a country that's full of people that aren't really ready to deal with that. And so um, instead of thinking about why certain phrases or words exist and what they mean, we just go, well, Negro might be bad, so we're just going to go to, let's say, like African-American. And then now we're trying to figure out, well, do we say Black? Well, now do we say uh, BIPOC? Do we do all these things? And then how do we now teach all of this? And if you're on the right, it's like, how best can I call this person an N-word without calling them the N-word? <laughs> you know, how best can I get them? Um, how can I go back to the the most restrict forms of uh, disenfranchisement without saying explicitly, I don't want black people to vote. But yet, it's, you know, it's 2023, but those dynamics have been in existence since, you know, 1619. I want to kind of finish our conversation here on uh, something that you kind of write at the end and give you an opportunity to present maybe a, a better way forward. You talk about the fundamental mendaciousness of anti-wokeism is the pretense that black Americans could somehow oppose systemic racism without, uh, without triggering white anxiety. Do you have, you know, you're the doctor in the room now. Can you <laughs> prescribe something to us? Give us the, the way forward. So, if I were to try to give a way forward, it would almost belie the thing that I said, because what I'm essentially saying is there is no way forward that's rooted in doing what's best for Black people. I hate to make it sound depressing or, you know, like I hate to make people feel hopelessness in that regard, but I don't know how to say it other than than that. There are white people who would rather die than uh, sign up for the Affordable Care Act like, or because it's called because it came from Barack Obama. Like when you're dealing with with that with with people who are in that state there is nothing logical that you can actually say so there really is no way forward but to i hate to say it play the game unless or unless you're willing to just be as revolutionary as possible which we really are not we're not there well the only thing we can do is is play the game so if if, uh, you know, and, and part of that is because on the left, 
once is so the moment that pro black sentiment is seen to um, energize the base and and in and, and is seen to um, inspire people to to vote for the Democratic Party. Everybody's on uh, uh, people on the left will support the hell out of whatever pro black thing that is. But the minute whether if, if it's even if it's ethically and morally the right thing to do, the minute that pro black policy is demonized on the right and it looks like it's going to turn off Democratic voters, people on the left will will shut it down. So there is no way forward that's rooted in um, blackness because the we're flanked from the left and the right. So the only way we have to, well, the only thing we could do is get together and say, how do we survive on a plantation? And this is the best way we can survive on a plantation. And we have to follow whatever that thing is. So um, for, I hate to say it, but if it means that um, we can't, we have to shift from uh, the name defund the police to whatever, then that might just be what we have to do. And it doesn't mean you don't, you make that shift without calling it out as like, um, as calling it racist. You can do those things. And you, we have to say the, the truth of the matter is we are held hostage by white supremacy. So how do we, how do we live and work um, inside of it, outside of it, and, and throughout it? Anthony Conright, thank you so much for your time and for your work bringing together these ideas. We appreciate you. No, thank you.